Afghans saved Canadian lives, and then they were abandoned. Interpreters and other Afghan workers stood with the Canadian Armed Forces on NATO-led missions in Afghanistan from 2001 to 2014. Uh, without any combat training or combat experience, these interpreters walked shoulder to shoulder with Canadian and other NATO soldiers in the battlefields for years. They believed a promise that Canada would protect them from a mutual enemy, the Taliban. The Canadian government broke that promise. In August 2021, the U.S. withdrew the last of the Allied forces that invaded Afghanistan 20 years earlier. The Afghan National Army collapsed. The Islamic extremist Taliban seized control. Thousands of Afghans and their families who had at great risk proven loyal to Canada, remained trapped behind enemy lines, hiding in terror, hunted by revenge-thirsty Taliban that view them as traitors. Reports of rapes, abductions, hangings, imprisonment, torture, starvation, home invasions, and executions seep out. 94% of more than 10,000 who worked alongside Canada wait in dire straits for the Canadian government to show mercy. Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada hinders approval of special visas to immigrate to Canada. It won't waver from an onerous, unrealistic, bureaucratic paperwork process. It demands security checks for Afghans already well vetted by the military they worked with. It won't remedy biometric processing problems. The response from the government of Canada has been dithering it has been slow, it has been incoherent, and quite frankly, now that it's no longer front page, it lacks any sort of energy or enthusiasm to actually produce tangible results. Fortunately, Canada has compassionate men and women. In their retirement, distinguished Canadian military generals and officers refuse to abandon allies and friends. They volunteer their time, work feverishly against incredible odds, managing to get precious few Afghans to safety. Months of calls, letters, and pleas to the Prime Minister and Cabinet Ministers urging action have been ignored. Enough, they say. They've united to urge the government to just come up with a plan to save lives, to salvage any semblance of honor for a disgraced Canada. I was the first commander of the UN mission in Sarajevo. I'm going to address an equally serious subject right now. And for me, it's painful because I never, ever thought I would feel this ashamed of my country. And I can't just blame the current government because the rest of us let them get away with abandoning tens of thousands of brave Afghans and their families who risked their lives working for us during the war there. We should all hang our heads in shame, as thousands of them are left to their fate while our politicians and bureaucrats dither about immigration rules. Fortunately, a small group of our veterans of all ranks have refused to be part of our shame, and with donated public support are doing the dangerous work in Afghanistan, hiding thousands of individuals and families and getting them out of the country to safety. Now, without the money to continue, their request for modest government funding continues to fall on deaf ears here in Ottawa. Our government preferring to give millions of dollars to an ineffective United Nations. Meanwhile, the Afghans who risked their lives for us and believed our promises, await their fate. Shame. Shame on us all. On the heels of 9-11, Canada joined a multinational U.S.-led military coalition that invaded Afghanistan. They toppled the Taliban-ruled Islamic Emirate. 
The Taliban mounted a formidable insurgency using guerrilla warfare tactics. Afghans shared a goal with allied forces to crush the Taliban, designated global terrorists offering sanctuary to other terrorists, brutal oppressors of Afghanistan's most vulnerable, women and children. As a matter of fact, we lost a few of those, uh, unfortunately, those interpreters and those that work with us on the ground. Afghans who chose to stand with Canada have a lot to do with why many heroic Canadian soldiers ordered into that war-ravaged, rugged terrain made it home. We owe them, and we have a moral obligation to help them in their time of need. That need exploded last August when U.S. President Joe Biden abruptly ordered the withdrawal of U.S. armed forces. They left in defeat. And we have an obligation, even though we failed in this experiment, to bring them here and resettle them in Canada. Despite tremendous sacrifice of blood and treasure, Afghanistan didn't transition into a just society as planned. Under the Taliban's new Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, the Central South Asian country rapidly returned to bad old habits, an abyss of unforgiving archaic laws. Women must cover themselves. Little girls are sold in marriage to old men and allies to Canada are hunted. These allies, struggling to survive each day, merely get promises and platitudes from Canada. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government promised to rescue 20,000, then 40,000. The Canadian government has, over the past many weeks, been focused on bringing uh, Afghans to Canada, on resettling Afghan refugees, on making sure all those who have fought alongside Canadians for a better future Afghanistan uh, remain safe and protected. We will continue as we have continued to work with partner organizations, with veterans groups, uh, with Canadians from coast to coast to coast on resettling up to 20,000 Afghan refugees. The challenge right now uh, is the situation on the ground. Uh, we are there, we are working with our allies uh, to ensure that we are bringing as many people out of Afghanistan as possible. Of course, much depends on the safety and security situation on the ground, uh, and we will, are doing absolutely everything we can uh, to bring people to safety uh, and to ensure that our allies do the same. Because we are talking about resettlement, uh, we need to know who these people are as they get on the planes, but we have indicated uh, that we are looking forward to accepting uh, as many uh, Afghan refugees as possible. The 20,000, 20, 21,000 number uh, is one that we've been talking about, uh, but we know uh, there may be a need to do more. And what we've seen from Canadians, like we saw with the Syrian refugees uh, back in 2015, Canadians are willing to open their hearts, their homes, their communities to welcome people fleeing from violence. Uh, just as uh, we saw uh, what happened under a conservative government around Syrian refugees, uh, it was the Liberals uh, that welcomed in 40,000 Syrian uh, refugees uh, that have made a huge contribution over these past five, six years uh, to Canadian society. We will be there to do exactly the same for Afghans, particularly given the level of connection and sacrifice that so many Canadians have made uh, for the benefit of Afghan people. Uh, I have been assured by immigration officials uh, that every flexibility is being given uh, to enable people uh, who can't fill things out online to be able to uh, transmit their information. Uh, there are phone calls, there are ways of reaching out to people to help them on this. And indeed, uh, people we have begun to engage with, uh, they will continue to be uh, uh, our uh, clients, our, our focus uh, over the coming months, uh, whether they remain in Kabul, whether they uh, make their way to a, a safe uh, third country outside, uh, we will continue to work with them in order to bring them to Canada and to ensure that it's done uh, in as efficient, as rapid and safe a way as possible. To date, about 9,000 Afghans have been brought to Canada. A fraction of those are Afghan allies already vetted because of their history with the Canadian forces. Three former task force commanders of the ground campaign in Afghanistan, retired Major Generals Dean Milner, Dave Fraser and Dennis Thompson, formed the Afghanistan Strategic Evacuation Team. Asset oversees several groups that managed to extricate 3,000 Afghan interpreters 
and relatives over the past year. After months of working doggedly, one group, the Veterans Transition Network, cited utter exhaustion and frustration with the IRCC and announced an end to efforts to help Afghans. Ali Hadari is one of the lucky ones they recently brought to Canada. Back in 2001, when OAF began, Afghans believed that it would be a long-term support to build Afghanistan. And we were very optimistic of a uh, nonviolent future. Uh, many Afghans accepted the risk and stepped in to support NATO presence in various fields. Uh, one of the most important fields uh, was language interpretation that was done by young Afghans who had sufficient uh, language skills. Uh, without any combat training or combat experience, these interpreters walked shoulder to shoulder with Canadian and other NATO soldiers in the battlefields for years. Unfortunately, uh, some of them lost their lives on the battlefield or were targeted by Taliban uh, while on vacation because Taliban believed that um, these interpreters are eyes and ears for the foreign invaders. Uh, some of them got lucky and got evacuated by the help of governments and veterans communities. But now, after the so-called collapse of the Afghan government, majority of them are uh, stranded in Afghanistan uh, with no security and no source of income, living in anxiety, and in most cases they are uh, facing hunger because they had to leave their uh, house and family behind running and hiding. I hope that Canada and also other NATO member countries put more efforts into helping those Afghans uh, who stood beside NATO when NATO needed them. Asset alone has identified 10,000 waiting in Afghanistan to be rescued. It relied on $3 million in private Canadian donations to get Afghans out and to keep 1,760 Afghans in safe houses at $20,000 per day. Donations dried up, the money ran out. In January, the Afghans were sent back on the street. The federal government refused and continues to refuse to fund safe houses. Immigration Minister Sean Fraser has been missing in action. He hasn't bothered to meet with the retired generals leading this uphill battle to save lives. I served in the forces for 38 years. Uh, a good, good part of that was focused on uh, the war in Afghanistan. Uh, I spent a couple years over there and I was the last commanding officer or last commander uh, in Kandahar during the war fighting portion. And I was also the last Canadian uh, in Afghanistan in 2014. Uh, when we pulled all of our training troops uh, out of Afghanistan. So with the situation worsening in, in Afghanistan uh, back in the summer of, of this past year, uh, I partnered with two other retired generals uh, and we wrote a letter to the government asking them to support uh, the intention of, of evacuating Afghans who had worked with us, served with us on the ground, patrolled with us, fought alongside of us. And we just saw that this, with the situation worsening and then the Taliban taking over, that we needed to, to evacuate those Afghans. So, uh, so we put this letter together. Uh, we initially received some support, some feedback, and the evacuation commenced. Uh, as you know, it was a traumatic, very, very difficult situation. Um, Canada, along with other countries, did manage to, to pull out uh, uh, a few Afghans. As a matter of fact, Canada pulled out 3,000, of which about 15% of that, uh, no more than 500, were Afghans that actually supported us and soldiered alongside of us uh, on the ground. Uh, so after the air bridge, bridge was closed, we continued our, our efforts uh, under the group called Afghan, Afghanistan Strategic Evacuation Team, ASIT. 
We have a number of organizations that have been working with us, Veterans Transition Network, who have, have, who have now um, moved on, but Am and Lara, uh, the Afghan and, and Canadian interpreters, uh, the, um, well, I've got to think, but journalists for human rights and a few others. And we've continued our efforts to try and evacuate as many Afghans out of Afghanistan that we, we can. Unfortunately, we just have not received the, the support that we need. There, there's no plan from the government. Um, they provided us a little bit of financial support, but we, we, we're moving out small numbers, but we need to move out a whole bunch more than that. So we're really, we're, we're, we're asking the government to do more. Uh, we need them to do more. The situation continues to worsen over in Afghanistan. We know that the, the, uh, the Afghans that work for us are being threatened. The Taliban are continuing to, to threaten them. We ask the government uh, to, you know, to, to support us, to, to take the leadership, to provide the financial support, the direction, and we will not end our efforts. We will continue to, to move and evacuate these Afghans until all of them have, have been evacuated. And we've got a lot more work to do. So we ask the government again, uh, we'd really like um, your leadership, your partnership and a plan to evacuate the remaining Afghans. Canada doesn't recognize refugees from Afghanistan as legitimate legal refugees. Applicants need a Pakistani visa to get out of Afghanistan. To get that, they must be valid passport holders. Many Afghans in that impoverished country are undocumented. They must get passports from the Taliban government. That forces them out of hiding and puts them directly on the Taliban's radar as Canadian allies. IRCC has ignored requests to implement solutions such as single-use travel documents allowing Afghans into neighboring Pakistan and biometric verification after they arrive in Canada. Meanwhile, abandoned Afghans' attempts to connect with the Canadian government are impeded by unreliable electricity, internet, and cell services. When they do get through to Canada, calls go directly to voicemail and are never returned. I'm speaking on behalf of the ad hoc group called ASSET, which is designed to help Afghans leave uh, that country and come to this country, Canada, under the uh, government uh, program to bring 40,000 Afghans. This is an important mission for Canada because these 40,000 Afghans and eligible Afghans who helped us provide hope and opportunity to that country, need our assistance today in getting out of that war-torn country that is going through a humanitarian crisis. We urge the government of Canada to fulfill their promise for the 40,000 Afghans under the program to tell us what the plan is and to help those Afghans come to a place that where they can have hope and opportunity that you and I take for granted. We owe them and we have a moral obligation to help them in their time of need and bring them to this great country of ours in order that we can live together and show them what it was that we were doing so hard for them now that they have decided that they want to come here. I urge the government of Canada to do the right thing and to expedite their promise of bringing those 40,000 Afghans to this country. I am a member of ASSET, which is the Afghan Strategic Evacuation Team a loose coalition of non-government organizations and charitable foundations that are, that are moving successfully eligible Afghans out of Afghanistan and resettling them here in Canada. You might ask, why is this important? Well, from my point of view, we the West, including Canada, are the ones that raise the expectations of everyday Afghans that we would help them, not do it for them, but help them build a more fair and just society. The fact that we have failed miserably in that project is not on them. They stepped up and they acted in, many, in, in a number of roles that put their personal safety at risk. And now it's putting not only their personal safety, but also that of their family members. Now, how has it come about like this? Well, myself and my two other uh, Major General retired colleagues, Dean Milner and Dave Fraser, wrote a letter 
to the ministers responsible for this dossier back in, on the 8th of July, 2021, asking uh, the government to put in place a program that would assist us in moving these people out in a rapid fashion. They answered with a policy statement that came out on the 23rd of July, 15 days later, which is actually pretty commendable. Uh, unfortunately, the country collapsed much quicker than anyone thought, and on the 15th of August, the city of Kabul fell, and essentially the country of Afghanistan reverted to the Taliban. It's also the day, incidentally, that the election was called. And so we were trapped in this uh, election writ time frame when all we had to lean on were policies and no new programs. The new cabinet after the election occurred on the 27th of, sorry, on the 20th of September was not announced until the 26th of October. And so in that intervening period, we struggled to continue to move Afghans out of the country. And I'm just gonna close by making the same request that I made with my brother, Major Generals, in, uh, on the 8th of July, 2021. What we wanted then and what we want now is, quote, an immigration program with an empowered government point of contact and logistical support that is fit for purpose in bringing these brave and loyal Afghans to Canada. That is what is needed. Nothing follows an initial acknowledgement from immigration of having received emails. The Taliban conquered swaths of Afghanistan before closing in on the capital of Kabul in mid-August. President Ashraf Ghani fled. Afghan allies wearing red pieces of cloth to identify themselves as friends to Canada turned to Canada for help. They arrived in droves at Karzai International Airport in the capital, Kabul. Canada was already gone. Canada's ambassador, Reed Sears, closed the embassy and fled August 15th on a half-empty Air Force plane. The emergency preparedness he bragged about while ignoring months of warnings about the pending doom from Asset and others weren't in place. Sears recently testified before a House of Commons Special Committee on Afghanistan that it was too dangerous for diplomats to stay. Chaos and desperation mounted. An August 26 suicide bombing at the airport during evacuation efforts killed 183 people, including 13 U.S. military personnel. Another 170 people were injured. Uh, I had the privilege of serving in Afghanistan as a deputy commander of the International Security Assistance Force and the senior Canadian in the area. Bottom line is, I got to know the Afghan people, especially those many thousands who risked their lives helping Canadians in the accomplishment of the various missions that the Canadian forces were assigned in Afghanistan. Fast forward to the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban again uh, last year. Tens of thousands of brave Afghans and their families were asked by Canada to come to Kabul to be administered so as to be able to evacuate from Kabul to Canada. What happened next is more than tragic. Uh, our aircraft were amongst the very last to arrive amongst all the nations participating. Key to all this is that the ambassadorial staff led by the ambassador left faster than just about everybody else ahead of the Afghans arriving in significant numbers, responding to the call for Canada to come to Kabul. So now we had thousands of Afghans and their families in Kabul who are readily and easily identifiable as not being local with no means to process them because the Canadian diplomatic staff have all left they fled, so they had to make their way to the airport where there's no processing capacity because unlike just about every other nation, our diplomatic staff led by the ambassador came back to Canada. And there was no one on the ground to actually help process. So very few actually got out. And we were amongst the first nations to stop the military airlift, but a week ahead of everybody else. 
Bottom line is tens of thousands of Afghans that helped Canada at the risk of their lives were stranded in Afghanistan, ready victims to the Taliban who hunted down and killed a significant number of them and is still going on. One solution that has been spectacularly successful is grassroots veterans organizations and led by senior diplomats and uh, retired uh, senior soldiers and general officers. To all of you listeners, get hold of your local members of parliament, federal members of parliament, and urge them to honor the promise they've made to those Afghans who helped Canada in Afghanistan during at the height of the fighting, whose lives because of their service to us are now at extraordinary risk from the Taliban. And there's a bunch of Canadian organizations who need modest funding to help expedite that flow of Afghans to Canada. And they're not getting. It. So up to you, please. We need your help. I had the opportunity to uh, visit the troops in Afghanistan and to see some very, very uh, serious, 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 serious dedication from our troops, but also from the Afghans who are helping us. And it was quite striking. As many of you may know, the Canadian forces made a promise to uh, bring to Canada those people that wanted to come to Canada if ever there was a problem, and um, or just to immigrate. Doing so, one of the things behind our mind, of course, was that we would win, and such would be ways we would do, do our due diligence to the citizens who were still there. Unfortunately, as everyone saw in 2021, there was quite a change, a shocking change, a disgusting change from our perspective. The disgusting part to me was that as you look, looked at those films of the airports, very few people wearing those red things to identify them as friends of Canada uh, were, be, were able to get out of there. I and my class of 1966, from RNC, got together and are addressing a letter to the Prime Minister of Canada asking him to help in protecting and preventing the catastrophic loss of life that will occur inevitably. Major com com uh, problems here are in fact the burdens of extrication from Afghanistan, the transportation and, and uh, to a friendly country and or directly to Canada and the immigration process that we have to get here. I am a soldier who has spent over 40 years in uniform. I was guided by three words, truth, duty, and valor. Truth, to do what is right and truthful. Duty, to get on with it, make sure that I have all the processes to do that, and valor when it gets a little tough, be it politically, militarily, geographically, or otherwise, to get on with it, make sure the best service can be rendered. Last December, IRCC's Fraser, blaming situational factors, told CBC it would take two years to get the promised 40,000 Afghans to Canada that our commitment to resettle 40,000 Afghan refugees has not wavered and our commitment to, uh, to support those who've supported our mission in Afghanistan has not wavered. There are extraordinary challenges, as you pointed out, uh, with the situation in Afghanistan. And I think you'll appreciate the chief amongst those challenges is that the Taliban has seized control of the territory. Canada does no longer have a, a diplomatic or military presence in the region. Commitment to uh, make one of the most substantive resettlement efforts. Uh, so the answer is yes to both. I want to really emphasize how important it is that the Canadian government provides safe havens for the Afghan interpreters that are in Afghanistan still. Without giving these people safe houses, which the government is refusing to do, there can be no survivors left in a short period of time. 
the Taliban are actively hunting down people that work for the Canadian Army as interpreters. At the time, Don Martin in 2007 noted that it was the most dangerous job in Afghanistan as there was a price tag of $40,000 on the head of each interpreter. What has changed? Nothing, except the Taliban are now in power and they won't have to pay out to kill these people. Our friends, our allies, we helped them. I did a tour in Afghanistan when the Russians left in 1989, but they were not as callous as we were. A lot of people made their way out. Afraid that there'll be no interpreters left to be evacuated if we don't do something about keeping the safe houses there in the next few weeks, let alone months. And by the, a year after the government promised to bring all these Afghans to Canada, the people that we want, the Canadian, the Canadian military personnel want, the people that worked alongside them on combat patrols, they're going to be dead. And when you bring out interpreters, you can't bring out just the male that served or perhaps in the rare case a female. You'll have to bring out their family and their relatives and their anybody related. Because if the Taliban can't get the interpreter, they'll get everybody related to them. Wipe out the whole family. They'll wipe out everybody. We're dealing with thugs, real thugs. If the people aren't kept safe in place, there's no point of an evacuation. They'll be just a burying bodies, and they're already being buried. I'm currently the program director of Amalora and formerly the assistant director of the Afghan Canadian Interpreters. These are just two of the key groups, advocacy groups in Canada supporting Afghans and two key organizations that have recently joined forces to tackle this arduous task. The Afghan Canadian Interpreters, known to most as ACI, was one of the first groups in Canada advocating for Afghans to the government of Canada. We at ACI believe uh, the government of Canada has a moral and ethical obligation to those interpreters and locally employed civilians who once supported Canada's mission in Afghanistan. It was apparent that the government of Canada was not prepared for the rapid and hasty fall of Afghanistan to the hands of the Taliban. Sadly, due to this unpreparedness, not many Afghans who ACI initially supported made it out during the evacuation between 15 and 26 August. To date, ACI has directly and indirectly supported approximately 1,100 Afghan families with a pathway to resettle in Canada. However, 94% of those families are still reporting to be in country. Having been a part of this crisis since the beginning, I can state that this arduous task is far from complete. Many Afghans face extreme dangers and many are prone to capture and even death at the hands of the Taliban. In addition, thousands who have had a profound relation with Canada still wait for IRCC to approve files. While it is easy to point fingers at Canada's slow reaction, I believe at this point that everyone is doing the best they can with the resources they have been given. This difficult task could have been achieved more proactively if the government of Canada developed more profound relations with all those involved early on vice months later. I call on the Government of Canada to continue to deepen the relations with all NGOs operating on the Afghan file and provide IRCC with the much needed resources to support vulnerable Afghans with a pathway to resettle in Canada. Our class though has a special focus. There's a special group that is at high risk within this refugee population. And these are the people who worked for the Canadian government during our time in Afghanistan. They served many support roles, and most importantly, they served as interpreters, working hand in hand, day to day with our troops in the field. Very courageous people. They are at risk because the Taliban considers them to be traitors, because they helped Canada fight the Taliban, and they will pay for it. When the Kabul fell, they were abandoned by our government. However, the prime minister and three ministers made public comments. They made commitments and promises that they would look after these people and keep them safe. Today, this has not happened. The majority of them and their families are still in Afghanistan and they're being hunted by the Taliban. So, What's been our, our, our class's uh, activities? Well, beginning in January 2021, we decided to write our members of parliament 
and urge them to press the government to take action to rapidly evacuate this at-risk group from Afghanistan. This was January 2021, seven months before Kabul fell, seven months. We indicated that the urgency, the clock was ticking. We indicated to them that the Taliban strength was growing. Government did nothing. We continued to write letters. In fact, our class wrote several hundred letters to MPs, ministers, and the prime minister. No action was forthcoming, and here we are today. Canada's reputation on the world stage has been compromised by our government's avoidance of this moral obligation they have. Evacuate these people now. The government of Canada must tell the people of Canada and the world that we leave no one behind. Dave Lavery, a founding member of Joint Task Force 2, an elite counterterrorism branch of Canada's armed forces, has run a small business in Afghanistan 11 years. When the embassy staff fled, ex-Special Forces Lavery was the only Canadian at Kabul airport for six days. He worked in the Baron, a strategic location next to the airport, to help Afghan allies with paperwork to get them to safe houses. The Canadian government had long been indifferent to their warnings of impending collapse, but ASSET and organizations under its umbrella had forged ahead and set up safe houses ahead of time. I'm in Antilia, Turkey, um, and um, I'm prepared to, uh, to have a speak uh, with you folks. So, and to give you an idea um, what we went through in um, in Afghanistan during the uh, the days prior, during and after the event, uh, we had a lot of talent in country during before the event, um, and we tried to present that in the best manner to the applicable people uh, within IRCC, Canadian Embassy, GAC, and even uh, reached out to the military just to let them know that. Um, what we are doing, uh, preparing for the event of an, an inevitable uh, closure of Afghanistan and to assist the Afghans in the special visa process. So that's very important for me to, to home in on because uh, we don't believe anybody took our, our reach outs uh, very seriously. The Taliban came into the city very quickly and at that point in time, we had uh, various safe houses for these primary applicants spread out throughout uh, Kabul city. And at that stage, everybody was in a major panic. They were more concerned on getting to the airport, evacuating. We were in the evacuation stage. I was the only Canadian asset physically on the ground at that point in time to be able to assist. There was no Canadian presence that I seen from the government or the military that was physically at the airport or within the barren area. It, was, it, was, it wasn't a good situation for our military also. They were put in a really bad position um, and it affected a lot of things, the harmony, the synergy. So this is a little bit what I like to get across too, if we're doing lessons learned, you know, we should basically explore if we have to go through this again, being able to tap into our resources a little better. We had so much to offer and I just don't know why they didn't tap into our amazing team back in Canada. Because now fast forward, we've got so much going on, so much help is ha happening uh, and getting towards the Afghans that are still stuck in, in, in Afghanistan, predominantly Kabul and, and certain other areas. Um, the voluntary team that's comprised of many groups, as I mentioned before, all volunteers and veterans, you know, we're comprised of the asset, which is the Afghan strategic evaluation team. It's not a one entity, as I said, it's just a group that we all come together and share the same harmony and the same vision. Uh, we all want to help these Afghan families and we're still pushing the government to support us the best they can. Let's work together and let's get more funds 
that are uh, that are required and we shouldn't have to rely so much on the private donors you know out there you know reaching and deeply into their generous pockets which they have but we can do a lot of things right now and we sh we are going to carry on doing a lot of things but with the support of the Canadian government I think we can go a lot further we're not going to give up as long as we still have families under our watch we're going to carry on and try to do the best we can to get them out